Hi, thanks for joining us today for this webinar. I'm Jessica Cheng from Cengage and our topic today is to share strategies for quickly transitioning courses online. As you know, the impact of COVID-19 is far reaching and changes daily. The global higher ed community is working hard to react thoughtfully to the changes this pandemic has required. Many of you may be teaching online for the very first time and this can be intimidating. Today, we are honoured to have part of that global higher ed community with us to share some best practices for quickly transitioning your face-to-face -face course onto an online environment. Our peer-to-peer -peer expert today is Sean Orr. She is the Director of the Centre for Innovation and Teaching Excellence, as well as a teaching academic in the Department of Communication Studies at Ashland University in Ashland, Ohio. She has worked in higher education for over 25 years as a professor, department chairperson and dean, and has taught more than 20 different courses in the business management, humanities and communication areas. Sean has delivered over 200 workshops and presentations on student success, online and hybrid learning, active teaching and learning strategies, experiential learning and 21st century skill development. Thank you very much for joining us and a very warm welcome to Sean. Thank you so much, Jess. I'm so happy and honored to be here with all of my peers. This um, global pandemic is affecting all of us in higher education. And our, our real key is that we want continuity of education for our students. So I was thrilled when Cengage asked me to um, create a webinar for my fellow academics to talk about how could we quickly transition our courses to use online learning tools to impact the continuity of education. And these are actual pictures of me. I will tell you that was me pre-finding out that our, uni our entire university was going online and that other picture was me just a few days ago post as I have chewed off all of my nails. So we really are all in this together and even, even those of us that are educators that do teach online and I teach a lot of courses online, it's very different from having months to thoughtfully process and think and use best pedagogy and andragogy and online teaching strategies and tools and having to very quickly utilize this learning environment. So the question that I hope this um, webinar will answer for you is how can we save the rest of the semester or the rest of the academic term and, and most importantly, positively impact our students' learning over this time using this online modality, these online instructional methods. So um, once again, this is a, a short-term solution really strong online courses that might um, use quality matter standards or your online consortium scorecards, those take months and months to develop. Maybe in conjunction with an instructional designer and you're, you're creating these magnificent webinars and interactive augmented reality programs, but that's not really where we are. So what we really have to consider is what I have to keep my expectations realistic. What am I able to really do in the next few weeks using these online tools to keep academic continuity um, moving forward in this period of disruption. So what I want to do is I, is I want to start out and really talk about some communication strategies in online courses that differ from face-to-face -face courses. I want to talk about synchronous and asynchronous methods of delivering content. I want to address some activities that you might consider in your own online courses and then end with um, some assessment, how are we going to assess if students are learning what we hope that they're going to be learning during this. So before we get into the heart of the presentation, I want to share, I, I decided to go on Twitter and look and say, what are people saying about higher education right now and what might happen as we move to online? So the first, and, and of course there's thousands and thousands of tweets about this, but the first one, a few are, were kind of funny. This one um, academic said, that her tutor and her were going to, she was going to have him dance and she was going to record lectures and they were going to be fabulous. And then the next student said, oh my goodness, if my academic, if, it, if the way they handle technology at the podium in my face-to-face -face class is any indicator of what this is going to go like, we are all in big trouble. So, you know, that, that was, there was all these tweets that were kind of this funny look at 
what's happening right now. But then there was there was all these other tweets that were were very serious about education and how um, this the moving courses to online are is going to affect students learning. So for example, there was a lot of tweets about how anxious students were about their ability to learn in this way or about their ability to collect, connect in meaningful ways with their academic or about um, how much work it was going to be to put everything online and how challenging it was going to be and concerns about technology in addition to concerns about health issues around the world. So I share this slide with you to um, just indicate that, you know, as a, as a world, as a, as a, around the globe, we are, are all in this together. We're all trying to find ways um, to be good global citizens during this pandemic and also continue to deliver what our mission is, which is education to our students. So if online teaching is brand new to you, you're, I hope I'm going to share some great strategies with you. And if you are a seasoned teacher just looking for some new ideas, I hope you also get something out of this as well. So I think one of the other things that, that I really want to highlight is that as an educator, I realize that many of my students are almost going through this period maybe of mourning what they thought the rest of this year was going to be. And in, in relation to the big picture of higher ed, it's it's not that serious, but to those students it is. So things like missing out on dances and sporting events and national championship um, sports teams and, and spring break trips with their friends and, and for some of the students graduation ceremonies and those, those are, those are real things and real reasons for um, students to feel sad right now. Um, I had one student tell me, um, Professor Orr, I've waited, you know, a whole year to get into this class and I'm so excited and now I don't even get to be in class with you. And I told them, you do though. Online learning can be just as robust. We can build just as strong of a connection online as we could face to face. And so much of life is about accepting the givens and focusing on the options. This is the given. It's not safe for us to be together. Not, not safe for us and not safe for our global community. So we are going to embrace this learning tool. We're going to do what we can to continue and move education forward. And that's the thing about faculty. At the heart of education are your academics. One of my favorite publications on teaching is the Learner Centered Teaching from Mary Ellen Weimer. And um, you can very easily Google Learner Centered Teaching. This is a fantastic book. At my university, we do learning communities around this to look at what are the principles behind really focusing learning on the student. And I think at the heart of this, I want to share is that is that teaching is about encouraging collaboration, helping students learn from each other, acknowledging that a classroom is a community where everyone gets to share the learning agenda. So our role as academics is more important than ever during this pandemic as we move things to online. So I want to start out and share six important um, ways that online learning is different than face-to-face -face learning and how we can use good communication strategies to help our students move in the right direction. So the first thing that I want to share about communication and this kind of goes with what I've already said a little bit before is that our students are concerned. They're concerned about is their technology going to work? Is the learning going to be as meaningful? Are they going to master the student learning outcomes? Are they going to continue to have feel like they have a community and connection? And so they're looking to us to say, how do we react to this situation? So the very first thing that I would encourage you to do is to connect with your students as soon as possible. My university canceled classes for several days to give faculty an opportunity to adjust their curriculum to these online tools. And during those few days, our students were concerned. So just reaching out, and I shared at the bottom of the screen, so you can certainly pause this at another time and, and use any of those words that you like. But, um, you know, sending a message out to your students and saying, it's going to be okay. We're in this together. I've got your back. You're going to learn. I'm going to be the one to help you learn. I'm going to make exceptions where necessary that we are in this together. One thing that I would suggest is that you use your learning management system to send out messages to your students. 
And that is for several ways. Email is fantastic. And we know that in most of our learning management systems, you can very easily send out an email to the entire class or groups. But here's the reason I suggest doing it on your LMS. First of all, when you send out a message, it can be pushed to every student's um, inbox. And we know that students are used to push notifications, content coming to them but it stays in the course. So students are able to go back and refer to the information many times. In a face-to-face -face class, I get to stand up and remind them of all of these important things several times every week. They may only get one major message from me, but every time they log into their learning management system, that message pops up. Another thing is um, it preserves educational records of connection and communication. So I have a record of all the times that I connected with the students, all the messages that I post, all of the assignments, all of the lectures. So if I use my learning management system as that communication mechanism, I have a record of everything that I've done, an educational record of how I've assisted the students in meeting the learning outcomes for the course. The second thing that I want to mention about communication is that in an online course, it has to be frequent and robust. Students need to be able to see that we are there with them. So things like posting announcements and sending emails and calling students that aren't logging into their LMS or completing their work. I know just today I went through every single one of my students and every single one of my class and it's great because the LMS will tell me when they got into the course, what they did, how long they stayed. And it takes a minute to send them a quick email and say, hey, I see you only watched half the video today. Is everything okay? Are you having technology problems? What can I do to um, assist you in this learning? But students need to see our presence. And I always use this rule of five. I try and reach out to my students at least five times during the course of the week. Now, the truth is I'm really teaching flipped classes and not completely online. And in a minute, we'll talk about synchronous and asynchronous. But because my students expected to be in class during certain hours, I'm using those for live sessions with my students. Now, I'm recording those sessions because I realize students might have technology problems. So students that can't join us live, even though that's the expectation and the hope, they can go back and watch those. But I try and make sure I have five points of contact every week with my students. So maybe we have two synchronous sessions, maybe I send them an announcement on Sunday, and I make it very clear when I'm gonna send the announcement. Um, I probably am doing online office hours, and if nobody comes to see me in my online office hours, as something happens, in my face-to-face -face office hours, if nobody comes to see me, then I use that time to reach out to them and say, hey, how'd the assignment go? Or I saw this fabulous post you, you put on the discussion board. I just really want to give you some individual praise for that great work. So think, did I make five touches with my students this week in my class? The third communication um, tip that I want to share is about feedback. In an online course, we don't have the same ability as we do in a face-to-face -face course to give group feedback, to stand up in front of the class and say, all right, here's the papers you just turned in. Here's three really great things in general about the papers and three things that we're going to work on in the second half of the semester. Or here's one concept nobody got on the exam, so I threw those questions out and we're going to talk about those again. We're going to do some additional lecture activities with them. So when you're giving feedback in an online class, it's difficult for students to see tone. So giving robust, full feedback, I usually create a document with several things that, that I know a lot, I'm gonna to want to comment on a lot of students' papers and then I can cut and paste, which makes it quicker. I use a lot of rubrics. Um, one tool that I really like that you can Google is called Rubristar, and it's a free online resource to create rubrics for, in your courses. Um, you can use other people's rubrics. There's thousands and thousands on there, or you can use their templates and create your own. But it's, it makes it very quick to be able to grade and then to be able to spend the time writing robust feedback. One of the things that I like to do is to give general feedback announcements. So if students turn in a paper, I'll record a very quick video with general feedback for the whole class about that assignment. And then the, in, the students can go into their individual assignments to see feedback. The fourth thing about communication in an online course is how important it is to be clear and direct 
in your expectations for the week. This is an example of what I put up in one of my courses. So at the beginning of every week, and I like the idea of using modules or weeks. So when they come in, we're starting in week nine. So it says week nine, uh, March 16th through the 20th and they know exactly what it is that they're supposed to be doing that week. And if I can tell them how much time they should expect to spend on each of these, it really helps the students stay focused and manage their time independently. Online learning is difficult because it takes a lot of self-discipline to get all of the assignments and projects done. And it's important to remember, our students, for the most part, didn't sign up for this. They didn't expect to have to be learning in an online environment. So obviously, offering grace instead of justice is probably going to be called for a lot this semester, um, you know, undeserved mercy. But the more direction you can give your students, the better. So for example, I would say the first thing you're going to do this week is watch this three minute and 20 seconds. 29 second module overview. Then you're going to read chapter number two. It's 21 pages long. And I'll show you in a minute how in my course I would actually embed the ebook into it so they could just click on it and automatically be reading the digital um, copy of the book which is a fantastic benefit for those for our students. Then you're going to watch this. Then you're going to submit this. Then you're going to participate in this discussion board. But it's very, very clear what they're going to do. And then I always come back and say, and this week we're focusing on this student learning outcome. This is the important outcome that we're going to be focusing on this week. All right, fifth online office hours. So we set up office hours um, as academics and students come and see us and make appointments. But a lot of times in class, we'll say, hey, so-and-so, you want to stay after for a few minutes so I can catch up with you about something? Or you'll call students out that, that might not be as engaged as you had hoped. Well, online office hours are a great way to do that exact same thing, to call people out and say, hey, XYZ, would you please plan, plan on stopping into my online office hours? I want to talk about the, the fabulous job you did on your paper or what have you. There's lots of ways to do online office hours. The tool that I really love is Zoom. Skype is a good one. Your university may have a, a variety of different tools, like you may have um, something within your LMS that you can do it, or you might really like Google Hangouts. So whatever tool, GoToMeeting or WebEx, there's lots of tools. The reason I like Zoom is it's free. Now, my university has the paid account, so we've got a lot of these really extra great benefits that come with it. But Zoom is so easy to use. That's actually a picture of me this week in my Zoom office hours. I minimize the screen. It's in the quarter and I work away. And, you know, during my online office hours, if nobody comes to see me, I'm reaching out to students. I'm taking that opportunity to build one of those five um, connections. So I really encourage you to use your online office hours and encourage students to come and see you. And then finally, the last communication strategy I would give you is to really prioritize what students need to know. We are, are offering ourselves some grace and some kindness and saying there is no time to create a high quality online class in a weekend. But what I can do is ensure that whatever the gold nuggets are in this week or in this class, that every student walks away with those. So whether I'm going to do synchronous or asynchronous lectures, whatever activities I'm going to choose, I'm going to focus on what the most important um, concepts are what the students really need to complete, master, or do. Now, I don't know how long your university is moving to online. We originally moved online for two weeks, and then it was expanded to the rest of the semester. So if it's a shorter time, one of the things you can say is, what do I need to do in the next two weeks or three weeks or four weeks to move forward so students can master the concepts? And sometimes you can front load lectures and do more lectures so you've got more time on the other end for activities and labs and assignments. Or sometimes you can adjust your assignments completely. But what I did is I prioritized and I said, all right, in this, in this course, this one course that I'm teaching, Here's the four things that students must have an understanding of, and we've covered two of the four. So I'm just going to focus on those other two, the gold nuggets. The silver nuggets, those things I hope they get that they would get out of reading and activities, that's great. And I'm going to let the bronze nuggets go. But everyone's going to know those gold nuggets when we get done. And that's what I'm going to focus on in my course. So how do we get started in developing these courses? My first suggestion is to begin with the end in mind. 
So once again, think about your entire rest of your semester, whether it's eight more weeks or 12 more weeks or four more weeks, and say what specific goals or learning objectives or projects are the, do the students need to complete to be able to A, master the content, and to be able B, for me to be able to assess and understand if they've mastered that content. So I can measure what do they know and do they know it at what level. So obviously that kind of data application entry level Bloom's taxonomy things are a lot easier to assess than going all the way up to evaluation or synthesis, um, you know, the creation of new knowledge. But the important thing to say is what is it that do, what is it that my students need to know? And once I've decided that, I can move into how am I going to teach it in an online environment? So we have two ways to teach in an online environment. We can use synchronous methods, or we can use asynchronous methods, or we could use a combination of both, which is what I'm doing in my classes. Because my students expected to have a synchronous class. There is a fantastic article. I put the um, um, citation for it at the bottom. It's called Teaching Effectively During Times of Disruption. You can Google that and the article will come right up. And it is fantastic. It's a resource guide by two academics from Stanford University. And part of this guide is they talk about synchronous methods and asynchronous methods and the advantages and disadvantages to both. So let's really quickly go over what these are and then I'm going to give you some ideas for each of these methods you could use in your course. So first of all, synchronous methods. That's whenever education occurs live or at the same time. So obviously face-to-face -face classes are a great example of synchronous methods. So you might do um, live lectures with your students or you may, um, at my university, we use Blackboard as our learning management system. So I might put my students in, um, in Blackboard collaborate groups or Zoom groups and they work on projects together that's synchronous. The advantage of synchronous is that it's engaging, it's responsive, you can very quickly adjust your lectures or your activities. The disadvantage is it's time consuming um, and because again, our, many of our students didn't realize they were going to be online students, they may not have access to the technology that they need. Here in the United States, many, most all of the libraries are shutting down. So students that might have been home and expected to go to the library to gain internet access or access to technology don't have that advantage anymore. Now, there's ways we can get around it. For example, Zoom allows students to call in and our students likely have phones. Um, but we do have to be considerate that why synchronous is a great engaging way, there are, there are disadvantages, especially in this very quick situation where we're trying to transition our courses. Asynchronous is education that doesn't happen at the same time. So students choose, certainly there's still deadlines and there's still projects that they have to complete, but students choose when they're going to access the course, how they're going to use the materials. It offers so much flexibility. And that's one of the biggest advantages of online education is the convenience and the flexibility to learn anywhere. Um, the other great advantage is students can go back and review all of the materials multiple times. So if it's a math class and they're struggling with a concept, they can go back and re rewatch the lecture or rewatch the Khan Academy video over and over and over again. Now, asynchronous methods aren't as personal. There's no real-time instruction. It doesn't um, form the same sense of community and connection amongst peers, though there certainly are asynchronous methods that can do that, like a, a well-run discussion board can still create a sense of community in your course. So let's look at some of the methods you could use in each of these. Let's start with synchronous. So I listed three free tools that you might consider using if you decide you want to deliver your content live to your students. So Zoom, Skype, and Google Hangouts are three video conferencing tools. You engage in live conversations and presentations with your students. What you need to have as a faculty member is a computer and, and audio. You do not have to have um, a, a camera, you know, and a lot of times faculty will choose to turn their camera off anyway, but you do need to have a microphone and speaker. You need to be able to talk and hear your students, um, and then obviously a computer. One of the nice things about Zoom is that, it, and 
and other tools as well. We use Blackboard Collaborate as well. Students can join via the phone. So if they do have technology issues or the, their internet doesn't have a lot of bandwidth and they get kicked off, they can still call in and hear the lecture. And many of these things you can record. So if you do a synchronous session, you can put it there. Or if nothing else, they can go and download the PowerPoint slides or whatever tools you're using, the article you're referring to in your lecture, and they can follow along that way. Two great um, strategies to consider if you're delivering synchronous uh, lectures is to have an agenda so students know exactly what you're going to do, much like you might write student learning outcomes or agenda on a board when you come into class. Here's what we're going to be doing today. Here's our agenda. It helps students feel comfortable and in control to know this is what we're doing. And then use presentation materials. So putting up the article you're reading or the poem you're analyzing or what have you on the screen and make those available to the students before the lecture so they can print them out if they have the access to do that. They can pull it up on another computer so they can be looking at those slides um, while you're lecturing. This is an example of one of the tools that I use. You can go to Google and, and um, just Google in zoom.us. It is a free tool that you can use. Um, you can have 100 people on one Zoom call. You can have unlimited one-on-one -on -one meetings. Here's the disadvantage of the free, you only get a 40 minute meeting. So that's all the longer your class can be unless you set up another Zoom call, but you can have as many of those 40 minute meetings as you want. Very easy to use, you sign up for it. I downloaded the Chrome extension so it showed right up in my Gmail email account. And when I go to make a uh, meeting, when I save something on my calendar, I just click on that little blue button that says make it a Zoom meeting. Um, for some people, it will be a little blue box with a white um, with a white camera in it. If you click on that, you can make it a Zoom meeting. And then it does everything else for me. So you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, it gives um, the students a URL to jump on. It gives them a telephone number to call if they don't have computer audio or they need to use their phone. And then I send that out to the students. We all jump on. Now, in the paid version, you can also do things like um, put your students in small groups. You can use polling features. You can record the Zoom meeting. But remember, we're having realistic expectations. We're being thrown into this very quickly. And if this is the tool we have available to us, it's a fantastic tool. Um, so don't worry about all of those other functions. And I always tell faculty when they're learning to use new technologies, just pick one or two. So use what you already know, and what you're already comfortable with, and then find one or two additional digital tools that will best impact whatever those gold nuggets are that you want to ensure that your students get. This is actually an example of a Zoom meeting that my students would see. I'm sure, you know, they just love my great big talking head on their screen because you can see I had no presentation aids with this one. But um, I always share the slides with the students ahead of time. You can see that little green button that pops up at the bottom that says share my screen. So if I don't want to be the big large talking head, I can share my screen and then go through the PowerPoint slides or I can show a video or whatever it is that I want to do. In the um, paid version, you're able to close caption it when you record it, which is a great fe feature as we consider our students with um, alternative learning needs that might need some accessibility accommodation. So it's great that it will close caption in the paid version. The free version will not. And just to let you know, if you do record any of the videos, an easy way to get that closed captioning is to upload your videos to YouTube and it will automatically close caption your videos for you. And then you can put them right in your LMS so that you're ensuring that we're, you're meeting the needs of all of your students. So you can see in this paid version, there's also breakout rooms and all of these other things. If you don't have that, that's okay. But the best thing is, is that you're able to connect one-on-one -on -one with your students in meaningful ways. And even if you're going to record all your lectures, I still really encourage you to do some Zoom sessions, if nothing else, to connect to your students and see how you're doing and be a real presence um, in the course. All right. If that made you feel a little stressed out, then look away from the side, pretend you're not even seeing this. But one of the questions I often get asked is, how do I know my students are still with me? Like in a face-to-face -face class, I can call on students or if they seem to be drifting off, I know that they're there. So these are some tools that you could use if you're like, oh yeah, man, I'm so comfortable with Google Hangouts or Zoom or WebEx, give me something else. These are, these are tools that you might consider. So three tools. 
Kahoot is a really great free um, game-based blended learning platform. So in one of your synchronous sessions, you can create quizzes or discussions or surveys, and my students love Kahoot. They love it to, to study for exams. They love it to do review games. And I've actually set entire courses up or entire lectures up like this where I'll do 10 different quiz questions. Um, the students join your Kahoot game, um, and then you can see that's what their phone would look like. The question pops up on the screen. On their phone, they get colors and shapes, so it is ADA compliant. They click on the answer, and then the answers appear live on your screen. So you can see, did my students understand this concept? And if they do, then you move on to the next concept, right? That's form of assessment. Why lecture on something they already know? But if you find out that only 20% of your students understood that, stop. And that's a great place to share your screen, do a little lecture, and then move on. So Kahoot's a great way to get students involved. Another way to do that is with polling. And there's lots of great polling features that you can use. PollEverywhere.com is a free polling tool that you can use. Again, students use their phone. You can embed a question into your PowerPoint slides. Students pull out their phone. They answer the poll question. They actually text the answer in. And then it shows right up on the master screen for your students to see. And you can decide if you look at the bottom on the left-hand side of your, of your screen, do you want it to be a word cloud? Do you want all of the answers to come in as a list? Do you want it to be a cluster? Do you want it to be like a ticker that goes on the bottom of your screen as students ask questions? Um, and then finally, Flipgrid, and I'm including Flipgrid. It's a little, it's a touch more complex to use, but I'm including it because the American Association of Libraries, it was voted as one of the best apps and the best websites um, last year. And EdTech Digest voted it the coolest um, tool, it won the coolest tool award. So worth looking at if you're looking for another cool technology. Basically, I, I got to use Flipgrid for the first time in a professional development session. And as, as the, the um, academic was delivering a presentation, he said, all right, and then this Flipgrid code came up, and we entered the code, and then you turned down your phone, and you answered the question. Which everybody, so everybody's kind of sitting in this room together, but think how amazing this is for um, distance learning. And they look into their phone, and then they start recording how they would answer that question. And then all of our recordings popped up on the screen and he clicked on a couple of them and ha and and heard what we had to say so there wasn't kind of that pressure to say who wants to answer this question we all got to take a minute and think about our answers record our little videos and pop it up and i think one of the neat things about any of these tools is if i was in a face-to-face -face class i i might ask who is a question but most of the time i'm not just going to say what are the four functions of management and then call on somebody because I want to know that everybody understands that. So I would say, all right, next we're going to talk about the four functions of management in your notes in the corner, write down what you think the four functions of management are. And then I would give them a minute to think about that. And I would say, all right, now pair with the person sitting next to you and the two of you decide, do you have the right four functions of management? So pretty soon they're talking to each other and we know students learn and retain about 90% of what they can teach somebody else, according to um, William Glasser's choice theory. So after they pair, then I would say, now square, get with another pair and the four of you, be sure you've got the right four functions of management. Then the four of them talk, then I call on one square to share. We, of course, call that think pair square share. So when I'm in an online environment, especially if I'm doing something synchronous, I'm looking for ways to emulate that kind of learning in an appropriate way. So giving the students a chance to sit back and think about an answer, record something, and then put it up and then learn from each other is a great tool to use. Now again, don't let it overwhelm you. If you're like, Ugh, I've never even recorded a lecture, you know, we're not looking for perfection. Our expectations are realistic. We're focusing on our students learning what they need to learn to be able to move forward in their educational plan. But if you're looking for a new idea, maybe one of these it will be interesting to you. Okay, asynchronous. So synchronous, we're doing things face-to-face. -face. What about asynchronous? And I think a lot of institutions and a lot of academics are choosing asynchronous methods right now because students aren't necessarily prepared to learn in an online environment because 
they didn't sign up for it. So we're using these asynchronous methods in conjunction. So let me give you three easy ways to do it and then one that might just take a little bit more planning. So here's the easiest way to deliver your asynchronous lecture. Now, is this the best practice? Probably not, but once again, being realistic and kind to myself and my expectations and saying what I need to make sure is the students get the content. So a very easy way, take your PowerPoint presentations or your Prezi or whatever tool you were going to lecture from and just annotate it. So at the bottom of every slide, you type out what you would have said on that slide, examples, places in the books you want them to look at, and then you upload that and ask students to look at it and Maybe during a synchronous session, you'll talk about it. Or maybe you expect them to each post one thing on the discussion board that they found interesting about that. Super easiest asynchronous method. A next one is just to write an overview of your lecture and then share that. So if you think of an announcement that you would post on um, your learning management system, you just say, here's the five most important things in this chapter. And then you write a little overview and then maybe you have a web link you want them to go to and look at, or maybe you um, have a picture that, that is relevant to that content. But basically you're just writing out what your lecture would be. And you know, again, and you're only hitting the gold nuggets. If I had two weeks to do this, I would cover all this, but here's the most important things everyone needs to get. Here's the easiest way. Use something that somebody else already created for you. So I gave you a whole list of great places that I go to snag good content for my online class because I had to get them up really quick. So for example, TED Talks. I use so many TED Talks. I'm, obviously, the people that do TED Talks are brilliant. And in 20 minutes, they're covering beautifully very complex topics. So see if there's a TED Talk on the topic. Here's another one. Uh, a channel on TeacherTube or on YouTube is called TeacherTube. If you've never been on it, go to YouTube and then put TeacherTube in. Thousands and thousands and thousands of videos created by teachers on different topics. So if I go in and say into TeacherTube and say the four functions of management, I will likely be able to find a video another faculty member has created on the four functions of management, I can snag it and use it. If you teach in the maths, in the math area, or Khan Academy, great videos that you can snag and use for your classes. So many great, so much great content that comes with our publisher's content. So look at the publishers of your textbooks or eBooks that you're using in your course and see, do they have PowerPoint presentations already created for that chapter that I could grab and use for my class? Here's another good one that a lot of people aren't aware of, and that's Merlot.org. So if you go into Google and search it, it's M-E-R-L-O-T.org. And I put a picture of that on the bottom right-hand side. And you can see you go into this organization and you browse by discipline. So I could go in and put public relations, um, non-probability sampling research methods, whatever. And then it's gonna pull up a bunch of content that other faculty have created that is free for me to use. So there could be lectures, there could be assignments, there could be links to videos that I could use and I can pull that kind of content into my course. Um, by the way, on the lower left-hand side of your, of your screen, you're seeing a picture of what TeacherTube looks like and the different content areas that just came up. And then don't underestimate your peers. So I knew one of the classes that I'm now quickly transitioning to online over the course of a weekend, one of my peers had already taught online before. So before, you know, obviously we're not at school. So I got online and said, is there any chance you've got any videos created? This is the area that I think I'm going to have the most difficult time with. And this faculty member sent me a bunch of content that I could use in my courses. And of course, this is what we're doing right now. This is peers learning from peers. What are you doing? And so many of these ideas that I've received. I literally in my office have a stack like this big of articles that I have pulled online from other colleges saying, use our things, share our things. Um, so certainly reach out and see what your peers might be doing. So all three of these are very easy ways to get material to your students in an asynchronous manner. Now, this is not as easy, but so valuable, and that is to record lectures on your own. So how can we do create pre-recorded lectures? There are so many ways that you can record lectures. Um, 
you don't even have to use any of these tools. These are ways that I like. Now, at my university, we have Kaltura. So I have it and every student has it. It closed captions the videos. It does all of these amazing things. So I record most of my lectures on Kaltura. But you may not have access to that at your institution. So all of these are examples of different tools that you could use to record lectures. I'm going to show you how to use just one of them. So any of these are good choices for free tools. But let me just show you how to use Screencast-O-Matic. So if you have never created a lecture, I'm going to show you how to use just one of these tools. Again, let me just give a word of um, advice, and that is if you do create lectures, make sure you close caption those. So whenever I create a lecture, if I don't use Kaltura, um, or Zoom, which will close caption it, I make sure that I upload it to YouTube so it will close caption it for me and then I pull it back into my learning management system. And I'm going to show you how to use this and then give you a couple quick tips for um, how to create a great video. So this is Screencast-O-Matic. This is the first lecture caption tool I ever used. I still use it today. Fantastic tool. It will record anything on your screen, your voice. You can use a webcam. You can save it to your desktop, or you can publish it to their cloud site so it doesn't take a bunch of um, your desktop storage space, or put it right in your LMS. This is how you use it, how easy. So you go to Screencast-O-Matic. So step number one, and then you still see this orange button that says sign up, it's free. And um, I just want to mention that the free version obviously doesn't have all of the great bells and whistles that the recorded version does. If you, if you have the paid version, and um, you know, obviously I don't work for any of these places, but it's, it's like $1.69 a month or something like that. It, it's, it's not very much to get a paid version of it. And in the paid version, it will close caption your videos. You can edit them and all of that. But again, let's look at what open educational resources are available to us in conjunction with what we can use use that our publishers that we know are high quality content has developed for us. So you go into Screencast-O-Matic, sign up for a free account. The second step is you see the orange button and it'll say launch the free recorder. So if you don't want to pay, just launch that free recorder. The third step is then you'll get a, a pop-up box and it'll say you want to open the screen recorder. And as soon as you open it, you're going to see a box on your screen um, that looks like this. So whatever PowerPoint presentation or whatever you'll pull up, I just pulled up one of my PowerPoint presentations that came with my publisher's content. And then it gives you this box that you can resize any shape that you want. You can say, just show my screen, still in my pajamas, don't want to be in this video. You can say, just show my webcam, I just want to do a lecture or welcome video for my students. Or you can say, show me both. I show the screen and then, and if you say show me both, it's going to make you a little box in the bottom right hand corner. Um, if you say just you, you're going to be that big talking head and just your screen, they're only going to hear your, your voice. Then you click on that record button. Um, you'll see it down at the left. Here's the thing with the free version, with the free version, your videos can only be 15 minutes long, which that's the best practice anyway. They actually say six minutes is the ideal time for recorded lecture. So we'd be much better to do four six minute lectures than do a 24 minute video anyway. Um, okay, so I would hit record, then here I am recording it. And you can see the blue button with the two lines, the little hamburger lines. Um, so I'm recording, yada, yada, I'm talking. You can see me down in the bottom right-hand corner talking as I go through my slides. When I'm done with my video, um, number six, it'll say, I'll hit the stop button and it'll say, okay, you done? And once I click that done button, it gives me a choice. Do you want to upload this? Do you want to sh just share it or do you want to edit it? So I said, I want to I, I want to upload it. So screen seven, when I said that, it said, okay, where do you want to upload it? Do you want to save it as a video file on your computer? Do you want to upload it to the Screencast-O-Matic site? Or do you want to upload it directly to YouTube? So maybe you have your own YouTube channel and you just want to upload it right there and let it be closed captioned. I said, upload it to Screencast. So number eight, it said, I'm publishing it, give your video a name, chapter number eight or whatever it is. I always suggest that you put your name somewhere with it. So chapter number eight, COM 205, 
or so it makes it easy to find in your whole list of videos and then you publish it and it gives you a link you can see here's the link this is just a fake video that I created um, to, to show you how to use this but you can see it gives you a link down in the bottom that you can share in your LMS or embed it automatically in. When your students watch it, this is what they're going to see. They click on it and there you are talking to them, yada, 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 and um, they're watching the PowerPoint slides. And just so you know, when you go back into the screencast site, it will give you a list of all of these videos. Now, we know how important analytics are in online. It's it's so much easier in a way in a face-to-face -face course because I know if a student isn't paying attention, I know if they're not there, I, if they didn't turn something and I can talk to them. But this way, at Screencast-O-Matic in the free version, which is what I have, at least gives you a little bit of data. So like, for example, I can see I recorded this video on March 12th and nobody has seen it yet. But you can see I recorded one on February 27th for my students and I got 20 views. I have 18 students in the class. It doesn't give me a lot. It didn't tell me, did every student watch it? Did they watch the whole thing? But at least I know that every student likely watched it and a couple of them went back and watched it multiple times, which is the benefit of asynchronous, right? They get to watch it more than once. So here's a couple quick best practices for recording videos. Keep them under six minutes if you're going to use a, um, an asynchronous methods like this. Several short videos is better than a long video. Plan your material ahead. Um, and then make sure, as you would if you had a student with um, a visual disability and you were describing your slides, on this slide in the top right-hand corner, you're seeing a picture of da 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 look down to the left hand corner where you're going to see this. So what we say when you're recording a video, think about describing what's on the page in addition to just narrating it like you would if you were giving a, a live lecture. And remember, some of your students may just have to go with your PowerPoint slides and your voice if they can't get on. Um, use a microphone, you get better sound quality, talk slowly, I know. I probably need to take that advice myself, right? But the best thing, if you talk slowly, when they close caption it, it's going to be more accurate. The faster you talk, the less accurate your closed captioning is going to be, then you're going to have to go in and make a lot of edits so that it's accurate for your students. Here's a great one. Make sure that your laptop is level or above. If it is below you, they're just staring up your nose the whole time. And the most important one, don't worry about perfection. We're being kind to ourselves. If, if I had months to create vi these videos, they would be brilliant and beautiful and I'd be on a gr green screen in the back and they'd be seeing all of the, you know these great things and I'd be embedding quizzes, but I'm being kind to myself. This is what we have time to do to make sure that students get the gold nuggets. So when you say your ums and your ahs and oh, where was I again? That's okay, we're human. Okay, what are your students going to do while they're watching your videos? So when I record, you know, when, when, you're, when you're having a synchronous session, you can call students out. When they're watching your video, I usually try and give them something to do. So I might say, here's the five points I want you to pick up from the video. Or here's a list of terms that you're going to hear me talk about. Write down the definitions to the terms. And then... I would also probably tell them in the book where they could find the definitions to those terms in case they didn't hear it during the video. Or I might give them, you can see the one I did on the top right hand corner for a business class I, I taught. As they're listening, they're trying to fill in the blanks. And then there's also obviously some um, things that are not just knowledge level that I'm asking them to apply and go back and look at. Padlet's another one of those great free tools that you can go to. Um, if you have your students watch a video, you can have everybody go to a Padlet, P-A-D-L-E-T dot com, and you can go there and um, you can kind of set up these private password protected virtual walls where students can talk to each other. It's an, it's an alternative way to use a discussion board. Um, so that might be another tool that you might consider. Okay, two, two important things. Whatever you're going to have your students do in class, whether they're synchronous methods or asynchronous methods, whether you're having them watch a TED Talk and then go do a Padlet or you're, you've recorded a video and you want them to fill out a worksheet or you've recorded a video and you just want them to watch it before class and be prepared to talk about it, be so clear in what students need to be doing. So this is an example of the week um, or an assignment that I would have in my class. 
you're going to submit this activity and here's a, here's a link. You're going to be watching this video and I've embedded it into the course. While you're watching it, I want you to think about these four questions because that's what you're going to be writing your two-page paper on. The clearer you can be to students so that they know what to expect, the more likely they are to focus on the gold nuggets in that video, whether you created it or somebody else did. Here's another great way that we deliver content is through our textbooks. So, so, um, so many fantastic textbooks and we really have to rely on this method now that we're moving to online instruction. Being able to use um, ebooks is a fantastic advantage for our students, especially um, because students can get instant access. So if they left their books in their dorm rooms or they don't have access to that material, they can get that very quick instant access to their ebooks and obviously at a, at a much lower price than what they would pay for, for potentially a hardcover book. But one of the great things is, is you can link directly to the book. So this is my class. This is one of the books I'm teaching from. When the students click on that book cover, it takes them right into that chapter in that class. And that's a fantastic advantage um, for my students. I can upload it right into my LMS. If you're going to use something else, make sure that what you upload, you have the right and permission to be able to upload. Um, and um, there's so many great digital courseware platforms that we can integrate into our LMS, but whatever you do, be very clear in what you expect your students to look at and read. Which leads us to the next thing. When I, aside from the lectures that I might use or the recorded things or my textbook or my ebook, what other tools or resources might my publisher have that I can use quickly because I've got to get this course up and running? Let me give you a couple of my favorite. You may or may not have access to all of these in your courses. Certainly, you want to reach out um, to your publisher, your learning consultant, whoever it is, and find out what might be available with your textbooks. But let me show you some of my favorites in my courses. So first of all, the ebook. Love an ebook. Even in my traditional courses, because it saves students money. And I know um, that the majority of my students have cell phones and they're okay with reading on a cell phone. I mean, that, that's hard for me. I would have to, you know, do this to read on a cell phone, but my students love it and they they want to do their work and they want to complete their things on cell phones. Here's something great about an ebook. Students can highlight in their ebook, they can leave themselves notes. Um, that little, the little guy with the, the looks like he's speaking on the top right hand corner of this, um, non-native English speakers, this is the read speaker. So this is a fantastic tool where the textbook can be read to those students. Really great tool. They can change the font size, they can put bookmarks, they can print pages out. So there's so many great things about an ebook and so many ebooks have these kind of engaging things built in like videos built into them and all of these other really fantastic tools. So ebooks are a really great teaching tool, even if we're not quickly thrust into this. So look, what kind of eBooks might be available to me on this subject, even if it's not originally one I had planned to use for this course, but I'm trying to get this content to my students. Here's another thing, and, and once again, your, your content may or may not have some of these things in it, but I love these video case studies. This was one from one of my business books where it was actually a learning activity. The students watched a little video and then there were questions built right in. So remember when I said, what kind of content have other people created? What kind of videos have other people created? This comes with my publisher's content. Fantastic way to reach the students. Um, I love case studies and do them all the time. It really engages students in that higher level thinking on the content, not just what are the four functions, but how could we, we apply them? And I do these all the time in my face-to-face -face classes. So I'll pull out kind of these, you make a choice adaptive case studies. You watch a little video, you make a choice, it gives you a different video, you make a choice, it gives you a different video, you make a choice. And I'll do them in class. And of course, you can see I bankrupted this company when I did this. And of course, my students love that. When I bankrupt a company, they're like, oh, that's hysterical. Professor Orr uh, bankrupted our company. But, um, but here's a way that we can use these in online classes. They're much more engaging. This can be assigned homework. Or you could assign every student to do this and then talk about the results on the discussion board. How much more engaging is that than just saying, answer these questions to, a to this case study and then send them in to me. And me, the academic, is the only one that gets to look at it. This way, everybody can get on and say, yeah, it took me six moves to bankrupt the company. And somebody else said, took me eight. And somebody else says, I didn't bankrupt them. You know, we made $2 million. And then you talk about it. 
in this case, leadership style. So how can you use these in this online course without having to create this content yourself in this very short time frame? There's also great online homework and quizzes. I obviously do use quizzes as assessment tools in my course, but sometimes, um, you know, I'll collect the quizzes back so that I can use them multiple semesters and change things on them. But these, these, you know, there's whole databases that they can choose from. Students get immediate feedback. Did they understand the concept so they're not building on incorrect knowledge in their mind as they go into the to watch the next lecture? So look and see what might be in your publisher's content that you could use that's already built in for you. Um, I really like open-ended questions, and certainly a lot of those are built in. I think this is web assigned, and if you teach any of those sciences or maths, there's all sorts of different things in your in your uh, MindTap course if you're if you're using any Cengage resources. But the idea is is that look at what's already been created. If you do create something for yourself, like you can see at the bottom on the right, this is the kind of open-ended question I would ask my students. That's great. I really suggest if you try something like that, that you consider using rubrics, because then that gives students a lot of robust feedback when they get that information back. Okay, how might I adjust an assignment that I currently have for the online environment quickly. So I teach communication, so my students do a lot of speeches in my courses. So it's harder to do speeches online. How could I adjust a speech or a group presentation at the end? And I just wanna give you some examples of how you might adjust for just one assignment. So if I was gonna do an in-class oral presentation, how could I adjust it to meet this learning modality? I could say, we're still doing in-class presentations and we're gonna do them via Zoom. And here's the, the times that you're doing and who, here's who's evaluating them. And we're gonna do it very similar to what we would do. We're just gonna do it um, via a different digital method. I could say instead, we're not gonna do the presentations because we're not doing any synchronous sessions, but everybody can annotate their PowerPoint slides and submit those to an assignment in our LMS. I could say, no, I wanna think outside the box. Instead of doing a presentation, I know digital tools are really important in presentations, so I want everyone to create an infographic of the oral presentation you would have done. Share them on the discussion board and we'll all talk about them. I could have that student lead a discussion board on the topic that they were going to do their oral presentation on. So instead of giving an oral presentation, you're going to lead the, the discussion board that week and maybe have a couple going at the same time and then you give all your peers feedback. Maybe I have my students pre-record their speeches and upload them using a tool like Screencast-O-Matic into the learning management system. Now, again, I might be the only one that sees those unless I have them upload them into the discussion board and then tell each of the students you have to watch three speeches and give them feedback. I could just forgo the speech and say instead it's a paper now. Or I could have the students do speeches, but instead of doing them digitally and having to switch from presenter to presenter, I have them do in groups. The thing is, is that we have a lot of ways that we can adjust our assignments and it takes creativity to say in this very short amount of time without the help of an instructional designer, how, what, what might I do to change my assignment so that I can meet the needs of my students and know that they're still understand the elements of effective oral presentation. All right, and then finally, I would be remiss if I didn't say something about discussion boards, which I, I think are kind of like, they're, they're the staple of um, online learning because it's a way to build that connection and community that our students so desperately need, especially right now as they might be feeling um, concerned or anxious, not just about COVID-19, but about not being there with you and about their learning. So I love discussion boards as a way to build community. So my good friend, Don Tharp, who is um, an adjunct faculty at Ashland University and our director of information technology, did a presentation on how to read, write a great discussion board question. And I asked him if I could use his information and share it with all of you. And he said, absolutely. But one of the things he said about discussion board questions is certainly you can do those that build connection like what was one fabulous thing that you did over spring break or what was one good experience you had or post a picture that represents how you're feeling right now whatever it is but as we think about discussion board questions how can we frame those so it extends the conversation outside of class which is what a good discussion board is supposed to do and remember it's very easy in your learning management system to 
to click the link that says students have to write their post before they're allowed to read anybody else's. If you don't click that, what I find is I get 24 or 30 answers that all sound exactly the same. So click that link, make everybody answer the question before they can read anybody else's. But he gives you some great examples on here, like how do you encourage higher level thinking in it? So you could have them watch a video and then say, you just watched this clip of this video. How does that video pertain to the following theory that we've been studying? Or considering you just read and discussed the fall of Mordor this past week, can you summarize um, the effects of teamwork on Frodo's success in it? Whatever it is, how can you word the question so that you're really getting them to apply the content in there? I think you can also, another great way to do a discussion board is to allow students to lead the discussion board with your assistance because you're going to be present. They need to see you there. Um, but Zoom's a great option if you want to bring in a, a guest speaker and then have the students comment on that on the discussion board if you're only using that 40 minute version. And then certainly, I love to put the students in small groups of four or five and make them really analyze a concept together. And then that means as a faculty, I might be managing seven discussion boards that week. But sometimes if you get 30 people it just it, the threads get very long and nobody really gets that like in-depth uh, connection that they do in those other ways all right and that brings us back to where we started with communication so we looked at a little bit about um, online learning we looked at six strategies to communicate effectively with our students in this new environment we looked at some synchronous and asynchronous ways to deliver the content we looked at what kind of activities how we might adjust those how we could use discussion boards uh, what might come with our publishers content what's already created for us so we looked at all of these kinds of things how do we prioritize and it brings us back to communication and I shared at the very beginning of this um, presentation, this Mary Ellen Weimer book on learner-centered teaching. And the one question that she asks in this book that I constantly ask my students in, a in an online environment is this, how did this impact your learning? So students might love a synchronous lecture or hate it. They might enjoy a discussion board or not like it, but I always ask them that question. How is this impacting your learning? How is this helping you learn? What did you learn by doing this activity? So coming back around to that communication. If your students didn't watch your videos, following up with them. If they didn't fully answer the discussion board question, reaching out to them. Building those kinds of real and deep connections. So how do we save the semester and positively impact our students? First of all, we need to be patient with ourselves and, we're, and our students. We have to keep our expectations realistic about what we can really do given how quickly we had to move things to online. We need to keep our students at the center of the learning process. The most important thing is our students and their learning. And then we have to celebrate our successes, right? For some of us, this is the first time we have taught in an online environment. And for other of us that are seasoned pros, we're really spending a lot of time helping our peers. So we want to celebrate all of our successes. Thank you.